Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is John Shattuck, who is the CEO of the Kennedy Library Foundation. During the Clinton administration from 1993 to 1998, he was Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. And then from 98 to 2000, Ambassador to the Czech Republic. He is the author of Freedom on Fire, an account of his work in the Clinton administration. John, welcome back to Conversations. Glad to be here. Thank you. Uh, what was your portfolio as Assistant Secretary? Uh, well, it was a mouthful. Democracy, human rights, and labor. And essentially, it combined uh, the promotion of human rights and the U.S. foreign policy on human rights with broader issues that had been explored but not really fully engaged in this position earlier on democracy. How do you, how do you build democracy in countries that are emerging from conflict. And then finally, I had the portfolio of international labor, which meant that, uh, that I looked at issues of labor rights and uh, the difficulties of, of embedding those labor rights in, in, in trade agreements, um, things like NAFTA and, and the WTO. And, and what background uh, did you bring to these endeavors? We, you were well, our guest a few years back, and we talked extensively about that. But briefly, uh, tell us a little about your work in, in, in civil rights and civil liberties. Well, I'd been both an international human rights lawyer and activist for a number of years, and before that, a civil rights lawyer and activist. I started my career uh, with the American Civil Liberties Union. I was the national counsel for the ACLU from 1971 to 1976. I was deeply involved in the Watergate issues at the time, and defending many of the people who'd been victims of the Watergate abuses of the Nixon administration. Um, I then became the director of the Washington office of the ACLU and, and was involved in promoting civil rights and civil liberties in the Congress, through the Congress, lobbying the Congress. I then went to teach at Harvard and was vice president at uh, Harvard of, for government, community, and public affairs and taught at the Harvard Law School, uh, civil liberties and uh, international human rights law. I became involved with Amnesty International and ultimately its vice chair um, and did <clears throat> a lot of international human rights work that was not done at the ACLU. Um, and in 1993, I was picked by President Clinton to be the Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy. Did, did it rights. surprise you that he, he asked you to assume that position? I mean, obviously you had the background, but, but you, you were not uh, involved in democratic politics, or at least uh, in his campaign. Yeah. Well, I, I knew him. I wasn't directly involved in his campaign. I had not, I guess what was surprising and, and refreshing in many ways is that he chose someone from outside of the foreign policy establishment. Um, I had not been a, a foreign service officer, and I had not previously been in the State Department or in government service. Um, but I had certainly taught and been involved in human rights work for many years. And um, I think uh, President Clinton on the campaign trail in 1992 showed uh, a great deal of interest in the subject of human rights and made many speeches on the subject. And during the course of uh, his administration, I think uh, he wanted someone who had come in from the outside in that way. Mm -hmm. And and it was uh, it was perceptive uh, uh, of Clinton to pick up these issues in the campaign, uh, because of course the 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 Cold War had ended, uh, and the the Yugoslavian um, uh, uh, trauma tragedy had had begun to mm -hmm. to unravel and so on. He also during the campaign had had uh, uh, talked about you know, getting rid of Saddam and uh, uh, not dealing with the butchers of Beijing and so on. So he, he staked out a position that was, uh, we will discover in the course of our discussion, much more extreme than the one that he actually uh, 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 would finally commit to as president. Well, I think what he found uh, in the campaign was the resonance of human rights, the rhetoric and indeed the reality of human rights in this post-Cold War period, uh, very popular. Uh, we had gone through a period of extraordinary democratic upheaval in the world, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the apartheid regime in South Africa, uh, the outbreak of democracy in Central and Eastern Europe and parts of uh, Latin America. Um, and Americans thought this might be part of the peace dividend mm -hmm. of the end of the Cold War, and indeed it was, uh, this forging of new democracies and, and new opportunities. Uh, 
Um, but human rights are always complicated, and there were forces that were at work in the world, and you mentioned them yourself in your comments a moment ago, that uh, became clear quite early in this post-Cold War period. The failure of states, the breakup of Yugoslavia, uh, the emergence of ethnic and racial conflict uh, in countries where the Cold War tensions had kept a lot of this under control, Central Africa, uh, Yugoslavia, Bosnia, et cetera. At the same time, there were problems clearly in promoting human rights at the same time as promoting trade and from promoting economic uh, uh, expansion and globalization of market economics, which was another part of the Clinton agenda. So it was much more complicated as the process unfolded. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I want to ask you something about the upfront before we get into the particulars of how policy was handled, and that is, uh, Wilsonianism in the American political tradition, because when one t uh, tries to look at how we respond to the world, you know, a continuing line is some of the ideas, some of the themes that, that President uh, Wilson posed. And, and what's interesting about uh, that uh, uh, program of Wilson's is that it's something that our leaders can pick up on, on the one hand, and it actually resonates with who we are as a people and, 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 and what the people like to hear. Talk a little about that and, and how you relate to that mm -hmm. tradition and how Clinton did. Well, of course, the Wilsonian tradition is the tradition of, of expanding democracy and putting the U.S. in the leadership role of promoting democracy and human rights around the world. And I think Wilson, uh, I happened to serve later as, as President Clinton's ambassador to the Czech Republic. Uh, Wilson, in many ways, was the father, uh, along with a Czech leader, Masaryk, of the Czechoslovak democracy that emerged at the end of the First World War. Um, but I think Wilson also showed, Wilson's experience, what I was just saying a minute ago, how complicated these subjects are. First of all, you have domestic politics in the United States, um, politics that uh, isn't necessarily international in its orientation. And Wilson ran into terrible problems in terms of the ratification of the treaty on the League of Nations uh, in the Senate, which felt that it didn't want to give up U.S. sovereignty toward uh, the kinds of uh, international ventures that, that Wilson was promoting. Um, and at the same time, you had U.S. economic interests that began to get in the way of, of Wilsonian vision. So the vision is important, and it's a clear element of U.S. foreign policy, and it does come from U.S. ideals, and they're important ideals, and, 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 uh, and yet they're ideals that need to be looked at in the context of the terrible, complicated realities of both of the world and uh, the realities of American politics. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, before we talk about the various cases that, uh, case studies that were the, the policy and problems that you struggled with, uh, let's talk a little about uh, the Somali uh, event, mm -hmm. uh, which has been portrayed in a movie called Black Hawk Down, and, and really which became a, an important uh, uh, concern uh, and, uh, uh, and made an important imprint on a policy uh, in the Clinton administration as related to intervention and human rights. And remind us about yeah. what happened there and its impact. Somalia was the first human rights war. My book is about human rights wars of the post-Cold War period. Somalia was a humanitarian crisis. President Bush the first. Um, led an American intervention with the UN uh, into Somalia to try to solve the problem of, of uh, terrible starvation and famine. And as the Somalia intervention developed, it became clear that, the, that Somalia was being run by warlords, and warlords were effectively p keeping people from getting access to food. And so the UN mission became a mission to search for warlords, particularly one warlord, Mohammed Idid, Farah Idid. Um, and that led to a, a much more complicated kind of intervention, which was uh, searching for a warlord rather than uh, assisting humanitarian uh, needs. And to move right to the bottom line on this, um, what happened in October of 1993 
was catastrophic from a political standpoint in terms of the future of peacekeeping and humanitarian intervention, at least in the short run. And that was the Black Hawk Down incident. Uh, 18 U.S. Rangers lost their lives. About 80 were, uh, were wounded. And in the most dramatic and terrible moment of that uh, failure was the dragging of the body of a U.S. soldier through the streets of Mogadishu by the uh, guerrillas who were working with the warlords on CNN. And it was on CNN in a way that was captured, which, which captured everybody's attention back in the United States. It led to a political disaster. Washington became deeply uh, antipathetic to uh, peacekeeping. President Clinton came under great pressure from the Congress uh, to restrict U.S. participation in future peacekeeping activities. And he issued a presidential decision directive, PDD 25, uh, some five months later, which basically said that the U.S. will not participate in UN peacekeeping operations or even authorize them through the Security Council unless they meet certain very specific criteria uh, which were very difficult to meet. Mm -hmm. so, so therefore every subsequent crisis, and, and this is especially true of, of the, the great tragedy of Rwanda, there was an overhang uh, from the notion, well, we can intervene, the loss of American life, the situation unraveling, uh, uh, which led to probably the greatest uh, policy failure uh, of the Clinton administration, uh, which uh, uh, in, a, in a sense permitted the Rwandan uh, uh, genocide to unfold. Mm -hmm. Rwanda, as I write in my book, was the perfect storm from a human rights standpoint, perfect in the worst sense of that word. Um, it came six months, the genocide that broke out in Rwanda came six months after the Somalia catastrophe. Um, it was a genocide that was very similar to what was going on in Yugoslavia at the time, which is that uh, cynical leaders were using ethnic difference between Hutus and Tutsis in that context. Uh, to advance their own cause by turning the ethnic groups against each other and fanning the flames of conflict by broadcasting through radio uh, terrible messages of killing Tutsis, uh, Tutsis having, having been the minority in the country. Um, and as the violence broke out in early April of 1994, uh, the United States and Europe, for that matter, because it was equally affected by the Somalia catastrophe in many ways, um, and the UN were, were all very skittish about uh, any continued peacekeeping operation. There was a peacekeeping operation in Rwanda. Uh, it was withdrawn uh, some two weeks after the violence broke out. And as I write in my book, the withdrawal was catastrophic because it essentially sent a signal to the genocide planners that the international community wasn't going to do anything about what they were doing. And I and a number of others inside the Clinton administration, and there were some European human rights activists who tried to do the same, tried to reverse the process and get a peacekeeping force back into Rwanda after the first one was withdrawn. And I went to the region. Uh, I was sent on a presidential mission to meet with the uh, presidents of Ethiopia, uh, Uganda, Tanzania, and others in the region to get them to agree to assemble another peacekeeping force to go in. And as I cabled back, uh, telephoned back, that I was making progress, I kept finding that the, the Pentagon was unwilling to commit any resources to support this additional peacekeeping operation. And so, the genocide proceeded at an astounding rate, and within 11 weeks, 800,000 people had been killed in the fastest genocide in recorded history. Uh, and I'll never forget flying over the river between Rwanda and Tanzania, and from about 1,000 feet, uh, one could see what looked like logs in the river, and then a very small plane, I had it fly lower, and you could see that it was basically the whole river choked with bodies. Um, it was catastrophic, and it was a direct result in many ways of the political catastrophe of the failure of peacekeeping in, uh, in Somalia, which was a failure that uh, I think was one of the signal events of the early post-Cold War history.
and it's a failure that rests both on the first Bush administration and on the first Clinton administration, but also on the shoulders of European supporters for uh, the UN at the time as well. Now, we, we've sort of set the stage for, for how uh, the Clinton administration would, would respond to a number of the, the, the subsequent uh, case studies. And in, in looking at them in, in, in the book, you, you define uh, five uh, syndromes, five uh, problems, uh, problem sets that you encountered uh, 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 bringing this kind of human rights agenda to uh, the broader foreign policy agenda uh, of the United States. Let's talk a little about them one by one and, and maybe relate them particularly. One, the, the, the main one, or the first one I should say, is interagency mm. gridlock. And, and I was even taken with your very clear description of, of uh, uh, what that meant because we often talk about bureaucracies in ways that don't help us understand no. uh, what's going on. We need to know that human rights is not some sort of theoretical construct that is uh, held over government and that government is somehow going to engage with it when it chooses to do so. Human rights uh, issues are worked through the bureaucracy like all other issues. The first syndrome that I describe is the interagency syndrome. And this is true for all administrations, modern administrations, and that is to change policy in the foreign policy area, but this is true for domestic policy generally as well. You have to get all the interested agencies in the bureaucracy to agree that a change in policy is called for. A change, for example, such as sending peacekeepers back to Rwanda. Um, and if one agency disagrees that even though everyone else may agree that that's a good idea, one agency can disagree and that essentially uh, blocks and becomes interagency gridlock. And if that agency is the Pentagon, which is obviously uh, behind any peacekeeping operation or would be, then it won't go forward unless uh, you get a presidential decision to move the whole process forward. But that leads to what I call the presidential decision syndrome, particularly in the post-Cold War period where Americans are not going to be telling their president particularly that they want him to do anything special on foreign policy because we're sort of withdrawn as a country uh, more or less after the Cold War. So the president, uh, but the president is not going to act without some degree of pressure on a controversial issue such as deploying peacekeepers to Rwanda, which might have a, a cost similar to the one that was paid in Somalia. And so that leads to essentially a presidential gridlock in terms of decision making. And that further follows to the third syndrome, which is what I call the public opinion syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, especially in foreign policy, the public is unlikely to lead. The public is not going to uh, push the president to do anything, although foreign policy is increasingly becoming a product of interest groups, to be sure, in this period where uh, we're searching for a new construct of foreign policy, contrary to or different from what existed in the Cold War period. Um, but if you don't get public pressure, uh, you're not going to have the presidential decision and the public is not likely to put the pressure on unless the president takes the bully pulpit and goes on television and says we need to send peacekeepers mm -hmm. to Rwanda. So you have a kind of a catch-22. The three syndromes end up reinforcing each other. Unless in those rare instances, and there were a number that I recount in my book where the president breaks out of the syndromes. Mm -hmm. And, and Haiti is an example yeah. where he, he does that. And, and, and initially, during the campaign, uh, uh, Clinton was critical of the flow of refugees. Then when he came in, he changed his mind. Uh, and then domestic politics yeah. intervened. Tell us a little Well, it's a very good example of how I think uh, foreign policy now is being influenced by domestic politics, much more than was the case in the Cold War era when, as I said, there were a widespread agreement bipartisan about the goals of the, Cold, of, of the U.S. foreign policy in the Cold War. Haiti is a country not far from the shores of the United States. Um, in 1993 and 94, a uh, human rights catastrophe was unraveling in Haiti. The democratically elected president had been overthrown in a coup by a military regime that then conducted massive political killings in Haiti. Um, anyone allied with the president, President Aristide, was likely to be picked up and, and killed or rounded up. And so many people started to flee from Haiti in small boats, and uh, they, many of them tried to make it and did succeed in making it to Florida and other places in U.S. shores. Um, 
that naturally became a uh, political question, uh, the whole question of how you deal with the refugees. At the same time, the Congressional Black Caucus became very interested in the plight of, of the Haitians. There are a lot of Haitian Americans in the United States. Um, and so President Clinton began to feel that this crisis, not far from our shores, required the kind of attention which a very distant catastrophe like the one in Rwanda didn't receive. And so he did go on national television. He did take the bully pulpit. And he did work to assemble a multinational force and got UN approval of that force uh, to go into Haiti and help restore the democratically elected president and remove uh, the, uh, the regime, the military regime that was causing such havoc. And so that was accomplished. Uh, and that was some six months after the Rwanda catastrophe. And as I write in my book, I think Rwanda had a, uh, a terrible but also galvanizing effect on the politics of humanitarian intervention in the United States. And since it was seen to be quite early on a catastrophic failure of f foreign policy, um, the president was willing to take risks that something similar would not happen in Haiti and therefore assembled a multinational intervention force for that country. Reading your whole book, I, I get the sense that the, the, the perfect day for human rights as opposed to the perfect storm is really that day in which both multilateral forces, uh, not military forces, but sentiment and, and, and interests uh, come together with domestic, a domestic coalition to say, we've got to do something about this situation. And uh, uh, is, that, is, is that a fair statement? And what, yeah. what, what, what makes that possible? Leadership and time working together, or what? Well, let, let's, let's look at the, the big picture here for a minute. Um, what I call in the book the forces of disintegration were very active in the post-Cold War period after these wonderful things that happened, uh, the fall of apartheid, the fall of the Berlin Wall, et cetera. And these forces of disintegration, which produced conflicts in many parts of the world as, as states failed and cynical leaders tried to use ethnic and religious and, and political differences to advance their own cause, there were high costs for these forces of disintegration. First of all, by 1995, some three million people had been killed inside their own countries in the post-Cold War period alone. Three million people in places like Somalia and Rwanda and Bosnia and Haiti uh, and Chechnya and many, many other places around the world. Second of all, there were 25 million refugees, the same number of refugees that we saw at the end of the uh, Second World War. And that was very expensive. The U.S. had to spend, some, by 1995, some $20 billion in humanitarian assistance and peacekeeping assistance simply to clean up after these catastrophes had occurred. So it became clear that it was really in the national interest to try to do something to contain the forces of disintegration. At the same time, I do think that there were domestic forces and domestic lobbies that began to have something of an impact. The human, I'd like to credit the human rights lobby. I think to some extent that, that played a role, but certainly so did the ethnic Americans, the Haitian Americans in the case of Haiti. And, uh, certainly uh, those um, who felt they were being victimized in Yugoslavia uh, played some role. And then finally, I do think that the president uh, began to see that these kinds of catastrophes could not proliferate on his watch without major political consequences. And so President Clinton, after uh, quite belatedly, uh, after the Haiti intervention that I described, also led an intervention into the former Yugoslavia, a much more complicated crisis, and an intervention that came uh, quite late, uh, after some 200,000 people had already lost their lives in that uh, conflict, but an intervention which I think was decisive and ended the war and began the process of nation building which is going on today. And then, of course, the intervention in Kosovo, which, uh, which followed upon that and essentially was another means by which these forces of disintegration were sought to be contained and lives saved. Now, you, you mentioned one other, uh, 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 we, we talked about the Somali syndrome earlier, but the, the final one was the conflict resolution paradox, and I want to bring that yeah. up. To, explain that uh, to us, and then we're going to talk about yeah. how you dealt with all of these. Yeah. Well, the conflict resolution paradox is really very simple. Um, conflicts, international conflicts as they develop, and 
in some ways it's very similar to interpersonal conflicts, probably can both best be dealt with at the earliest stage, at the time when they're not really uh, heating up to the extent that major, large numbers of people are being killed or divorce is being contemplated. Um, but that's the time, at least in the foreign policy context, when you're least likely to be paying attention. There's a constant bureaucratic competition for airtime in the foreign policy arena. And at the same time that the Rwanda genocide was underway, the Middle East was in crisis. Bosnia was in crisis. The uh, relations between China had, and these are all human rights issues, had been uh, set into a tailspin because of differences over human rights. And so you have a, a, a combination of events that are pushing forward only the most visible and catastrophic. And by the time the policy process focuses on something like Bosnia, as it finally did in, in 1995, um, it's very late in the game. Many lives have been lost. And it's almost too late to do the kind of preventive work that will save lives. Um, but by then, the CNN is showing all the bodies, and the president is probably spending much more attention. But it's, it's, always, it's then the most difficult time to intervene. So the paradox is um, intervention early, uh, you know, a stitch in time saves nine, and you know, intervention early will save lives, but it's the time when intervention is least likely to occur. Now, okay, we've got a set of problems here. You've come in with this human rights agenda. I mean, you're not alone, but, but uh, it, it, the, the buck stops with you. Uh, what were some of the strategies developed, you, you, you developed to deal with? As you mentioned one earlier, that you would get on a plane and go to the hot spot and, and, and get on CNN yourself, I guess. Mm -hmm. it, it, talk a little about your, your strategies for dealing with uh, these syndromes in, in light of what you wanted to achieve. Well, there were many strategies. Um, and above all, the strategy was to seek alliances within the bureaucracy, to find people that would work with you. Um, and I was fortunate over time to find many such people. I mean, they were, uh, they weren't necessarily human rights people, but they were concerned about the, the political costs of further disintegration of Yugoslavia or the, the humanitarian costs in certain ways. One of the ways uh, that we focused human rights advocacy was by spotlighting abuses, gathering information. Information in Washington is a commodity. It's very important and accurate information and an ability to produce it and to show what's happening could make a big difference. I and Dick Holbrook and a number of others who were working in the administration on Bosnia to change the policy um, had to produce evidence that what was happening was not the result of ancient hatreds, as some people who were trying to wash their hands of the situation felt, but it was the result of direct orders and, and uh, activities by Slobodan Milosevic and Tudjman and other leaders of, of, the, uh, of those who were trying to engage in ethnic cleansing. So I put together 15 reports inside the Human Rights Bureau of the State Department, gathering evidence from many sources, from non-governmental sources, from the UN and from our own people in the field, um, using intelligence information and proving rather definitively that this was not an ancient hatreds war. This was a war that was being manipulated by leaders, and those leaders should be charged with genocide and war crimes. And I think by 1995, we were able to uh, swing the process around. One thing I did very specifically in the summer of 1995 was to travel to the refugee camps in central Bosnia, where the victims of the genocide in Srebrenica were emerging. And the victims um, all were telling that there were 7,000 men missing, and where are those men? I finally found some of those men. Uh, they were the few who had made it into the refugee camps, and I interviewed them. And these men told me these horrendous tales of surviving their own executions. And they gave me graphic descriptions of how the Bosnian Serbs had conducted those executions, the places that they'd been held, uh, the coordinates, not the coordinates, but the towns in which they'd been held, etc. I filed a report uh, which went to the intelligence agencies and several heroic younger CIA officers stayed up all night for several nights rifling through the uh, 
materials for the aerial surveillance photographs that the intelligence community mm. had maintained to find the evidence of the information that had been given to me by these survivors. They found it. They found the smoking guns. They found the surveillance photographs. Those photos were then taken to the UN Security Council and shown by Madeleine Albright in mid-August of 1995. Uh, the U.S. policy was changed, NATO intervened, and the Bosnian Serbs were forced, as, along with the Croats, uh, to the negotiating table, and the Dayton peace process followed. Now, that was, a, that was an important spotlighting enterprise, mm -hmm. which resulted in a change in policy. So, so it's about, in part, building alliances across the bureaucracy of, of, of in a way, like-minded people or people who are uh, open to new kinds of information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, I, I would like to ask you now to talk about China. Mm -hmm. And what, what's interesting about uh, China was that it's a case where there was a lot of hope <clears throat> about how things uh, might change, how human rights could be part of our new merging uh, relationship with them. It was a, a topic that Clinton took up in the campaign. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it was also the case of a major power, or a power that really was emerging in a in a in a very strategic way uh, uh, among the other great powers. So, so I guess the question is, let's understand the framework that Clinton created at the beginning, mm -hmm. what agenda that gave you, and then in the end, when push came to shove, where the administration yeah. wound up. Well, to understand China and human rights and the, and the Clinton dilemma, which actually continues to be the dilemma of the Bush administration, in fact, I think in some ways it's gotten more uh, in, to be more of a dilemma, you have to look at the uh, events of, of June of 1989 in China when the Tiananmen Square massacre occurred and when the rest of the world was experiencing these outbreaks of democracy and human rights. The Berlin Wall was about to fall. Uh, and it seemed as if there was a democratic revolution sweeping the globe. Well, China was really the crackdown country, and it was uh, there were thousands of people killed and hundreds of thousands of people who were uh, uh, affected inside China by that effort to bring about internal change, and some many many of them went to prison. Uh, that put a, cast a, a pall over U.S.-China relations, which of course had opened up since the Nixon, Nixon administration. Nixon goes to China and all, all that followed. Um, there were also U.S. Uh, companies that were engaged in, in a great deal of business in China in the, in the late 1980s, and many of those uh, economic relations uh, looked as if they were going to come to an end around the Tiananmen Square period. Uh, President Bush the first, um, in order to continue the process of engaging with China, downplayed the Tiananmen Square events uh, it, to catastrophic effect, I think, both for him politically, uh, because it did become a campaign issue, and I think also from the internal standpoint in terms of the efforts by many reformers in China to bring about change. And he basically said, let's keep doing business as usual. Clinton said, no, we're not going to do business as usual. Um, and in 1992, he argued for a much, much stronger engagement with China on human rights. He thought he could have it both ways. He thought he could have an engagement on human rights uh, and that he could also have economic and, and political engagement. Um, and he put forward a strategy of uh, conditioning the renewal of China's most favored nation trading status on improvements in human rights inside China. Um, and I was, along with others, the person who was to carry out this policy uh, by meeting with the Chinese, uh, by laying out with, for them what they had to accomplish within the next uh, period of time. It was a relatively modest agenda. It involved the release of uh, prisoners from the Tiananmen Square uh, period, uh, visits to prisons by the International Red Cross, uh, a lessening of the repression in Tibet, and a number of other issues uh, as well. Um, it became very clear early on that there was going to be a huge tug of war within the Clinton administration, and the Chinese were able to take advantage of that. And the tug of war was between the economic interests that wanted to re-engage with China, a uh, massive market, uh, and, and certainly uh, very much in the American interest and the European interest to engage with China, 
China was opening itself up, market economic reforms were being imposed. And many people said, that's the way for human rights. Let's just open the process economically and the human rights will follow necessarily. Uh, and uh, so it was very, very difficult to carry out the uh, economic pressures that Clinton had imposed by conditioning MFN. And within a year, Clinton backed off his MFN uh, commitments and essentially opened the process up and downplayed, once again, the human rights uh, elements of it. And it was a very difficult time for me and for Secretary Warren Christopher, who was the Secretary of State at the time and had been pushing for the implementation of this Clinton executive order on human rights. Um, and I, I, think, uh, I, th I think, on the other hand, it was probably a policy that was too, um, it, was, it was too extreme in a sense. It, first of all, it was relatively unilateral. There were no other countries that were willing to take these kinds of human rights risks. Second of all, for human rights to bear the burden of an economic relationship, improvements in human rights, uh, was probably unrealistic in, in that U.S. economic relations with China were very, very strong, or, had, or there were interests in the United States that wanted them to be strong. So it was quite easy for the Chinese to play off both sides of this. And uh, as I said earlier, I think uh, President Bush uh, II, uh, I think, is having an even more difficult time of it. I think we've now seen a, a complete swing back to the period of kind of laissez-faire, and the Chinese are our allies on the war against terrorism, so it's essentially no, nobody's going to pay a whole lot of attention to what they're doing on human rights. Uh, there's a lot of frustration in the work that you were doing uh, as the, 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 uh, the human rights uh, point man. And, uh, uh, you raise in the book a number of times, or several times, the possibility of resigning, you know, in, if, if not in protest, then just, just leaving. I think uh, it definitely probably came to your mind with regard to China. It probably came to your mind with regard to, to uh, Bosnia. And uh, you decided in all those cases to stay. Now, you had mentioned earlier that this is about choices and presidents uh, at the time that you're worrying about resigning or thinking about resigning or choosing between economic interests uh, versus human rights interests vis-a-vis -vis China. Or in the case of Bosnia, the question of will the military go after the war criminals or is peace more important? Talk about the way that you, you dealt with that and in the end you stayed. Yeah. Well, it certainly was often a frustrating time. Uh, but it was also a, t it was a, a very dynamic time. I think what, what, I mean, the simple answer to why I stayed was that I think everyone was learning as we went along, certainly on the issue of humanitarian intervention, on which I claimed uh, no special expertise. No one really did. This is something that had never happened before. It was the end of the Cold War. These kinds of interventions to save lives in cases of genocide and crimes against humanity were new. And so I, I, I learned myself that it was important to try to press the bureaucracy and press the, the, the political world, indeed the Congress, to recognize the importance of these issues. And resigning uh, didn't strike me as something that was going to advance that process. Better to use the knowledge that I had gained from inside, what I'd witnessed in my own experience in Rwanda and in Bosnia and, and, and in Kosovo, use that to try to advance the process. And in that respect, I felt ultimately gratified that we did come through the uh, 1990s with a doctrine of humanitarian intervention that didn't exist beforehand. And I'm glad I stayed. In the case of China, uh, it was more complicated. And that was probably the closest I came. Um, but what I, to resigning that is, what, I, what went through my mind there in the uh, period after President Clinton made his decision not to continue to pursue this relatively aggressive human rights approach that he had chosen at the beginning of his administration, I could see that he himself as president was subject to all of these conflicting uh, pressures. Um, and I was one of those pressures in a sense, not that I was pressing him, but I was trying to implement his policy. Um, I did not see that my resignation was going to improve the situation for the enforcement of human rights in China. If anything, I might well have been succeeded by someone who had less of an interest in that mm -hmm. process. 
So I chose ultimately to stay. Um, and I think I'm glad that I stayed in both instances, both with respect to all the humanitarian intervention issues where I think we ultimately came out ahead and with respect to the more difficult even issues of how do you deal with human rights in a big complicated country like China. What I feel proud of is that I think we moved the human rights agenda into the center of foreign policy. We lost a lot of ba battles along the way, but starting out in the uh, 1980s, I think human rights was quite marginalized. It was not seen to be a major uh, part of our foreign policy, and to the extent that it was, it was a part of the foreign policy that was used to advance our Cold War objectives much more than it was to be even-handed and deal with human rights crises wherever they existed. You've given us a good uh, statement of, of the problems of the 90s and, and what, what emerged from, from all of that work. How has 9-11 changed things? Well, 9-11 has, has almost completely changed things, I think. I mean, there are three specific immediate results from 9-11. First, uh, and, and, and all three of them actually, if you can believe it, I'm going to regard as positive. I think they, they, they had a positive short-term impact. First, the forces of disintegration, which were causing, wrecking such havoc in Rwanda and Bosnia and Kosovo and other human rights wars of the 90s, were really not being uh, attended to by Americans. Most people paid very little attention to these distant wars that were going on far away from our country. Maybe Haiti, they paid a little bit of attention. And to some extent, Bosnia. But 9-11 um, woke everybody up, woke them up to the forces of disintegration. They flew right into the World Trade Center. Second, I think 9-11 uh, demonstrated that the swamp of Afghanistan, the human rights catastrophic swamp uh, where abuses had been among the worst in the world uh, since over a decade, was the swamp out of which terrorism emerged. And it was and not by accident that al-Qaeda found the Taliban to be its most trusty ally. And so the third result, which I also applaud, was the assembly of an international coalition led by the United States early on to intervene in Afghanistan. And I think the intervention in Afghanistan was exactly right, uh, and, it was, and, it, and it simultaneously accomplished both counterterrorism and pro-human rights objectives. And so those three short-term goals, uh, three, uh, results of 9-11, I think were quite positive for human rights. However, uh, I think after two years, um, the pressure on human rights in the war on terrorism has become uh, almost overwhelming everywhere. And, uh, and those early positive results, I think, are are now much, much more problematic. First, we see that allies like China and Russia and, and Indonesia and other countries where uh, uh, dissidents have been trying to bring about reform, those dissidents are now more and more regarded as terrorists. And, and the crackdown on dissidents is allowed in the name of fighting terrorism. Uh, so reformers are having a very hard time around the world. Second, we've had the crackdown on civil liberties in the United States. And the fact that American citizens now can be designated by the Attorney General of the United States as enemy alien combatants and have the Bill of Rights stripped from them completely um, is an extraordinary assertion of, of uh, executive power in the name of fighting terrorism. And fortunately, that case is now going to be reviewed by the, by the United States Supreme Court. We've had an erosion of international law um, where we've seen uh, the holding of, of thousands of prisoners in Guantanamo uh, and a claim that the uh, Geneva Conventions in all their uh, various ways don't apply to those prisoners because these prisoners were not wearing uniforms on a field of battle and they're not traditional combatants. That too is going to be reviewed by the United States Supreme Court. But I think it shows a, a disregard for basic international human rights law uh, in this period. Uh, then we've had a substitution of a new doctrine of preemptive unilateral war uh, for the old doctrine of multilateral humanitarian intervention. And that doctrine, of course, has been used in uh, Iraq. And I think Iraq called out for a multilateral humanitarian intervention. Certainly the removal of Saddam Hussein, one of the worst human rights violators, is something to be applauded. But the way it was done, I think, has created a greater risk of uh, 
conflict and alienation within the region because it was done unilaterally. Uh, and finally, I think the United States has lost much of its soft power in this period, and the soft power of projecting human rights and international law values um, uh, is, has, has been lost. And so 9-11 um, has been complicated, let's put it that way. It had initially some very important positive uh, results, which I think still are applicable in terms of waking up to these forces of disintegration, in terms of demonstrating that Terror, the battle against terrorism has to be related to the enforcement of human rights and, the, and, and, and stopping human rights wars. But uh, the way that battle has been uh, conducted and, and the way the war has been waged over the last two years, I think, has led to a serious erosion of human rights. How, how do you explain <clears throat> the, the success in the first instance, the <clears throat> Afghan war, and the failure in the second instance? Because one, one of the stories that seems to be emerging is the exclusion of all the uh, information and ways of doing things that we had acquired uh, in the 90s uh, through these various interventions, which some of which we undertook reluctantly. And that was all uh, pushed aside and discarded uh, in uh, planning for the aftermath of the Iraqi intervention. Well, there are, yes, there were many lessons of the human rights wars of the 90s which were learned the hard way, and we've talked about that, and there were important lessons. Um, first, the lesson that you do need the international community behind you in order to have a legitimate uh, authority once you've gone into uh, a country to try to stop a human rights war. Second, uh, you need to have um, some partner with whom you can work inside that country. Um, and a, it doesn't obviously have to be a, a partner who has previously been in power. In fact, more often than not, you're going to have, uh, I mean, you're not going to be able to work with a government in power. Uh, but you've got to have somebody with whom you can work. Um, a third, you've got to connect the civilian uh, nation building exercise, which is very complicated with bringing security very early on through the intervention, through aggressive peacekeeping, which is not f the same as fighting a war, but it's, it's keeping the peace once you go in. I, I think all three of those lessons have not been followed in Iraq. This has been a u relatively unilateral intervention with the British at our side, uh, with vast skepticism throughout the region and the world and, and others not participating. Therefore, it is perceived as illegitimate, even though uh, it, I think it could well have been justified as a humanitarian intervention were it done differently. Um, then I think you've had uh, the problems of not being able to identify an internal partner. We've put a great deal of stock in these exiles who've been, uh, Chalabi and others who've been out of the country for 25 years, uh, who've really did, did not been able to gather any kind of internal support. And how it was we ever thought they were going to be able to go in and govern is beyond me. And then we've had this vision that we were going to transform the Middle East through some set of apocalyptic events that would follow from uh, the intervention that occurred. Uh, I think that was so far out of realistic balance with what was likely once we went in that it's kind of colored the whole intervention. Um, and then third, I think we've, we've not found the, you, the very heroic American peacekeepers who've, who've, who are now there, who were part of the U.S. force that went in, trained to do the kind of work that needs to be done. And they are heroic, I mean, and they're learning on the job. And in many ways, the success, uh, the fact that the operation has moved forward, I think, is a result of the, 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 the way that the U.S. soldiers have, have, have been so uh, heroic. And, and, and the leadership of the U.S. Army, I think, has been heroic. But they're not, they, aren't, they weren't trained for this. This wasn't what was planned. And there was a, what we now see from many news accounts is that uh, the planning for the post-war process was completely devoid of any involvement by civilians, uh, which was a terrible mistake. And again, something that we should have learned from all the earlier interventions that we engaged in. Looking back at, <clears throat> at your career and, and the lessons that you've learned, and, and you know, uh, you, you have a distinguished career in, in civil rights and civil liberties, and not, not just all this international 
uh, uh, agenda that we've just been talking about. I'm, I'm curious, uh, what, what in a nutshell do you draw from that experience about nation building, building democratic institutions, and so on? You, you've looked at, at a lot of contexts. You've looked at the U.S. context in, in, in terms of civil rights. You know, you were uh, in the Czech Republic looking at a place that was modern before it went through the, the you know, the, the communist period, and it probably it was easier for it to emerge. But so in, in a nutshell, it's a very complicated world. We have a set of ideas of how, how to build nations and how uh, to transform countries, to lead them toward democracy. What, what reflections do you have on that set of problems? Well, uh, the, the most immediate and, and I think profound reflection that I can offer is that every situation is different. Um, every, and, and that you have to understand the context of the situation in order to be able to be of any help at all. The medical world has the Hippocratic Oath do no harm at first. And I think if you're going to deal with this very complicated set of issues involving the intervention internationally in the affairs of another country um, that's sovereign, even though it may be in trouble, you better at first do no harm and figure out how it is you can go about doing that. Now, you want to save lives uh, at first if genocide is underway and, and there are instances in which intervention, including military intervention, is absolutely essential. It should have been done in Rwanda. It was belatedly done in, in Bosnia. It was done in Afghanistan. It was done in Kosovo. It was done the wrong way in Iraq. But it, was, but it, was, it needed to be done. Um, <clears throat> I think you, you also cannot assume that any model of democracy certainly our own model, but even any other model, is necessarily going to work in another country. And so you better listen closely to what you're hearing. Now, there are certain fundamental things that every democratic transformation needs. Above all, it needs the rule of law. And that was my experience in the Czech Republic, uh, which, although it, it has emerged from its communist past, is still struggling very much with the rule of law. And um, what do I mean by the rule of law? I mean predictability in human interactions and a sense that the government is not above the law and can be held accountable. And that, that's probably the one constant and universal in all these situations. Uh, I think it's in that area that the prospect for transformation in China is perhaps the greatest. I think the quiet legal revolution that's going on in China, particularly around um, economic relations, but also that spills over into, into other personal relations, and the concept of accountability is beginning to emerge. And, and so the rule of law, I think, is, is above all what's needed. Uh, there is an uh, adversary out there. It's, it's somewhat murky. You, you said something. There was a sentence in your book that I want to quote to you and have you explain what it means. I learned that evil is a reality, not an abstraction of moral philosophy, and that the killers of innocent people must be held accountable or evil will prevail. What did you mean by that, and, and what's the way of dealing with that? Well, um, yeah, this is a very uh, popular view these days, mm -hmm. is that we've got to go to war against evil. Uh, and I don't ally myself necessarily with those who say that, that, that we need a, a kind of an international jihad against evil, because there are many jihads, and they're being conducted from many different points of view. I think, above all, we need, we need humility and an understanding of the circumstances in which other people find themselves. Having said that, however, I have looked in the face of those who have committed massive crimes, who have killed hundreds of thousands of people. I've met Slobodan Milosevic. Um, I've dealt with him. Um, and if you do not hold people like that and others who are perhaps less well known accountable for committing the kinds of crimes that they've committed, which uh, and the bodies that they walked over in order to be able to advance their own cause, uh, then you're going to have more of that. Um, and certainly there's a battle inside everyone constantly oh, between good and evil and, you know, and, and, and always trying to choose the right path, which is why I think in the end the rule of law uh, 
and the, and the institutions that come from law are probably the single most important elements of human rights uh, in the world. And I'm very proud of the fact that on my watch we created two international criminal tribunals to try those who were responsible for genocide. First time done since Nuremberg and in many ways a more complicated process than Nuremberg because this wasn't victor's justice, this was international justice um, imposed in situations where many, many countries were involved. Uh, I also believe in the International Criminal Court, which I'm sad to say the current administration is doing its very best to undermine on the theory that it doesn't want any international rule of law imposing itself into the affairs of the United States. But I do think people need to be held accountable for their crimes, and particularly those crimes that are the worst crimes that humanity has defined, genocide and crimes against humanity, which involve killings of massive numbers of people uh, for political purposes. One final question. Uh, we have a few minutes left. Uh, you are head of the Kennedy Library, and when one looks back at, at U.S. foreign policy, it was President Kennedy who one might say was the last American leader to really uh, provide a vision and s inspire uh, uh, broadly masses of young people to, to uh, participate in implementing that vision. Uh, am I wrong that he was the last? And, and if not, what, what are the elements uh, that we need to hope for in the future that that would happen again? Well, I think Kennedy came at a very important point in our history. I mean, it was the middle of the Cold War. It was a time where we'd, we'd, we'd gotten a little bit sleepy in the 1950s, and we needed to wake up. And we did wake up uh, to challenges around us. He was a Cold War president, and he, was, and he certainly led the United States in its battle against international uh, communism in the sense that, it, that uh, against the Soviet Union and mostly against its, its, uh, its aggressive intentions. Um, but he did so in a way that constantly gave hope to people that there were values that could be brought to bear on these problems and not necessarily always military solutions. I think the, the leadership that Kennedy showed in the Cuban Missile Crisis is an extraordinary example of a president constantly pushing back to seek peace where others were pressing for war and ultimately to succeed by knowing his enemy, Khrushchev, getting to know what was going on and then trying to anticipate what it was that would back off this terrible crisis that almost led to nuclear war and frankly which would have led to nuclear war if, if Kennedy had listened to the advice that he was getting from uh, his military advisors at that point. Um, so he gave, he gave a sense of hope. There was obviously the style and the youth and, and, and his call to commitment. He also was the only president who, in my view, in my knowledge, anyway, I haven't studied all these uh, addresses, but the inaugural address contains repeated references to human rights. Mm -hmm. And he calls for the great international alliance to battle the enemies of um, mankind together. You know, war itself, hunger, uh, denial of human rights. Um, and he does this in the middle of the Cold War. So he's basically marshalling the resources to try to confront the Soviets at the same time he's holding forth a vision of opportunity for the world to find peace. And, you know, obviously the fact that he was cut off uh, so violently at the end uh, made him a figure that people continue to look at as that young, vigorous president at the time. John, on that uh, positive note of hope, uh, uh, thank you very much for being here and, and discussing your, your years in the Clinton administration. Thank, thank you, you very much. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.